I first want to go over bios with folks uh, just so that we can jump on and be familiar with one another. There is a PDF link to this on the website. So on Stonewall, you will scroll through for the trans talks. And if you want the extra bios, again, there's a link to the PDF on uh, the website. So we can start with Marin. Marin is happy to be a part of the Stonewall team and feels lucky to get to work with so many different LGBTQ folks in the rural area. Their role for Stonewall is that they travel across Butte, Glen, Closa, Plumas, Tehama, Placer, and other counties to support organizations in creating more gender inclusive and LGBTQ plus friendly spaces to support these community. In accessing the resources they need, Outside of the role in Stonewall, they also work with Safe Space, Winter Shelter, Northern Valley Harm Reduction Coalition, and regularly facilitate workshops on crisis, de-escalation, and trauma-informed care. Next is Dr. Adam is a gender-affirming surgeon at Mosaic Care in San Francisco, California. Uh, Dr. Whitney Dixon is also on the call with us. They are a gynecologist specialist in Cali Chico, California, and has over 30 years of experience in the medical field. Um, Sorry, my screen is freezing. I actually can't read the rest of the bio, uh, but I believe you all can see it, right? Okay, I'm just gonna continue forward. Um, Julie is a mother of three kids and has a wonderful husband. Her youngest daughter is transgender, began transitioning when she was nine. Together, they started that journey by seeking mental health expertise and lining up appointments at UCSF. Her daughter is now 18 and ready to leave the house in the fall. Aiden is a licensed clinical social worker, has provided medical health care to their transgender, non-conforming, and non-binary communities for over 15 years. Aiden has trained professionals and families across the United States and internationally specializes working with parents and caregivers of trans and non-binary children of all ages. Um, again, it's cut off for some reason, so I'm just going to keep going. Dr. Steely is a psychologist with a private practice in the Chico community. She provides mental health services to adults of all ages and some teens. She's an ally and supports the trans community by writing letters for folks seeking gender affirming surgeries and procedures. Dawn Winter received their associates in nursing at Northeast Community College in Nebraska. She has worked in eight years in relation nurse at Madonna Rehab Hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska and received certification in rehab nursing in 2000. Um, her family has recently moved to Chico in 2006 and began working at Inlo, where she currently works as a director of the Education Center and Conference. In March of 2019, her son came out as transgender. She shares uh, some insight on that. Next is Dr. Emily Hartman, who is a board certified plastic surgeon and reconstructive surgeon in their six year of practice. She has a passion for working with the trans community to support quality to surgery options, top surgery options, excuse me. Dr. Hartman is originally from Chico and moved back with her family after training, and they do have a practice here at Chico again. All right, so let's jump into the questions. I'm going to open the chat here and insert the questions there. From our panelists, anyone is free to jump on and begin. We'll start with the first one here. What surgeons are available in the area for gender reassignment surgery? Dr. Hartman, I might kick it to you pretty quickly, but um, in my role at Sonal, I do a lot of referrals for trans affirming surgeons and gender reassignment surgery. Dr. Hartman, who's on the call with us, is one of our top surgeons in the area um, and is super wonderful. And I've, we've received a lot of great community feedback. I don't know if you want to touch on that about some of the services you offer here. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm excited to get to start everyone off. Um, so I have been in the community for about six years and have um, whittled down the things that I really enjoy. And so top surgery definitely lands um, up at the top because it's, it's, a, commun it's a community near and dear to my heart. Um, <clears throat> I am, however, not the only one in, in Chico who provides um, these services, Dr. Kevin Myers is another plastic surgeon here in town who does top surgery, as well as um, uh, Sean Hashemi is an ENT surgeon and he's relatively new to our community, but he does uh, vocal feminization as well as uh, facial feminization surgeries. So he's a new asset to our community. Um, and I just found out that he was providing that, that care. So I'm excited to share it with everyone. 
Uh, and I know that um, there's some other gynecologists in, in town. I'm sure Dr. Dixon can speak to this, uh, but this is, there's, there's more support um, coming down the pipe, which is exciting. I've heard good things about Dr. Hashimi as well. Uh, he presented once at a little conference and he is new, but really great to see that service offered. Hi, I'm Whitney Dixon. I'll add to what uh, Emily just said. Um, I don't currently do surgery, but Dr. Garrison has been doing a lot of surgery support in the community. Unfortunately, he's out, I think, for a medical issue. So I'm actually starting um, a conversation with several of the new gynecologists in town this coming weekend at a meet and greet. Um, so I am hopeful I will have some more information in that regard in the coming week. I don't know if Dr. Byington, you wanna to touch a little bit on some of the bottom surgery available and as far as I know, there are no surgeons in the Chico area, but we often refer down to the Bay Area, which is where you work. Yeah, so we're not in the direct community, but we're just a few hours away, not, not too far. And considering a lot of our patients come from all over the country, it's relatively close for us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I work at Mosaic Care with Dr. Heidi Wittenberg, and we focus primarily on trans feminine bottom surgery, so vaginoplasty surgery. Uh, both penile inversion and the peritoneal pull-through method as both first surgeries and revision surgeries. And then also we offer a, a penile preservation option for non-binary individuals. Um, we also offer gender-affirming hysterectomies for trans-masculine individuals. Um, and then Dr. Wittenberg also offers uh, metoidioplasties. And then in the Bay Area, we, we're kind of lucky to be a little bit of a hub for, for gender-affirming surgery. So outside of our practice, there's a surgeon or several surgeons representing probably all the other um, surgical specialties as well. Just to throw a couple of shout outs in there, I think we refer to Mosaic uh, in your practice and some of the other surgeons in the Bay Area that uh, provide a lot of trans affirming surgeries and care is the Crane Center for Surgery, Align Surgical Associates, UCSF Transgender Care, the Gender Confirmation Center, which is Dr. Scott Mosser and Dr. Alexander Bach and uh, Dr. Bowers are kind of um, along with Mosaic, the other providers we often refer to. And I'll say too, I think it's the Gender Confirmation Center with Mosser and I think it's Fakeway. Uh, Dr. Zara Lay just joined up from um, Toby Meltzer's group in Arizona. So she's with them now too, um, which is an awesome addition to the area. I think we're ready to move on to our second question here and I'll drop it again in the chat. In regards to hormonal blockers, are there any negative effects on young teens? Is there a recommended age before using? I assume that's gonna get thrown toward me. <laughs> I'm Whitney Dixon, gynecology. Um, I think that um, there are advantages and disadvantages, of course, but in the big perspective from my limited experience, uh, they have more advantages than disadvantages. Um, of course, you have to go through the consent um, with potential bone loss, but for the most part, uh, stopping the unwanted puberty changes saves a lot of mental health issues. So, um, Myself and my daughter, Alyssa Milliron, both um, feel like in the right patient, hormone uh, blockers are a great option. Um, I will add, although I'm, I'm not a physician, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, I am lucky enough to be married to Dr. Olson Kennedy, who um, is a pediatrician adolescent medicine specialist who's been providing trans care for about 17 years or so down here in Los Angeles, although I'm in Oregon right now, but generally down there in Los Angeles. Um, and so um, I will speak only as um, an observer and having worked with hundreds of young folks who are on blockers 
um, both when they started at 10 or 2 pubertal stage, which is the very beginning of puberty, and those folks who are on blockers throughout um, the subsequent um, tanner stages of puberty. And clinically, what I have seen and, and what I very much support and stand by is, is similar to what Dr. Dixon said is, is that um, when the Dutch team in 2007 first wrote about pubertal suppression medication in the care for transgender youth, it was a game changer um, because obviously it prevented unwanted secondary sex characteristics, which then drastically improved, um, either prevented negative health outcomes or improved people's health outcomes. But it also really helps um, if folks then wanna move on to gender affirming hormones, because when you're younger, um, you have more hormone receptors and people generally uh, physically transition better when they're in puberty. That's generally how bodies, how bodies work. Um, and um, I think some of the concerns that I've certainly heard and, and I know certainly Joe has heard as we've you know, traveled across the world doing medical and mental health training is, um, you know, that there's fear that there won't, uh, that will impact cognitive development. There's fear of, um, as Dr. Dixon mentioned, um, like people's concerns around like bone density and bone loss, um, and then also linear growth, right? And, and so I can, again, not as a medical provider, but as somebody who has heard a lot about it for many years, um, that um, there is no cognitive development is, is not impacted. Um, that, that um, puberty is not the indicator for cognitive development. Um, and so if you suppress puberty, puberty, it's not going to impact cognitive development. Um, and it's also not gonna impact linear growth. That's why when you're 10, you're not the same height as you are when you're two, because um, there's a lot of mechanisms that impact uh, linear growth for folks. Um, and in fact, you know, puberty blockers are really advantageous for folks who don't want to grow taller. Um, it's really, really important for folks who, who are not interested in having a taller stature regardless of their gender identity, that they have the opportunity um, to prevent that if, if that's not something that they want. Um, and the, the only you know, other piece that I feel really uh, is important to say is, is that um, puberty blockade is meant to stop further movement into puberty. So puberty blockade medication should, from my perspective and the medical community that I am part of, should never be started prior to somebody starting puberty. Um, that is sort of standard practice and, and certainly supported by WPATH and, and uh, you know, multiple different medical associations that, that it really is about when somebody starts that pubertal process, stopping it. Um, but to introduce medication prior to when it's needed, um, I think is um, uh, poor practice and, and certainly in the medical group that I am part of uh, support that. So again, not a doctor, but hopefully that was helpful. You don't have to be a doctor to give good advice. <laughs> I think that all of that is really um, how I practice. I'm, I guess, hesitant to come out making incredibly strong statements, but I feel very much that blockers help people process their decision and help parents process the decision. Um, even if you aren't immediately starting hormone, gender affirming hormones, uh, but it also makes the gender affirming hormones work much better. Preventing an Adam's apple is much easier than having surgery to take one away and many other characteristics. So the one interesting comment I'll add to that too is as we see more patients who are um, undergoing blockers early on, they're not developing their, their genitals in the same way. And as a surgeon who turns one type of genitals into another, it presents a challenge at times because there isn't that same amount of skin and tissue that there used to be. Um, and we have other ways to, to work on that now. We have the peritoneal method, which is not experimental, but definitely newer and has less data. And so it is something we talk to people about who have been on blockers is that the kind of more traditional method of using skin to, to create a vagina isn't necessarily an option for people who never fully develop uh, through puberty. Thank you for actually adding that. I had never thought of that and have never discussed that with patients. So that, that helps me to understand that. Yeah. And I don't think it would be a, a, so far as to not recommend the blockers for that reason. It just would be something that we'd have to talk about afterward. I think that all medical interventions are, are sort of series of strategic decisions. 
right? Like whether you're talking about blockers or gender affirming hormones or even surgery, right? Like as a trans person, I, although I transitioned well into a, adulthood, even for myself at 30 years old, it was, it was like, you know, it's exchanges. Like these are the things that I want. I may or may not get them or I may get versions of them. Um, but, but to get those things, I'm also going to give up some things. And, and does that feel worth it? Does that feel like a, a good, is that, is that a good path for me to, to pursue? And, and, um, you know, it's, it's tough if you're going to ask a trans girl, um, you know, to, to move far enough into puberty, which becomes like tricky of like far enough into puberty to be able to develop um, enough genital skin to have uh, um, penile inversion. But then you also risk, you know, to, to both of your points, like you risk the other part of like an Adam's apple or your voice dropping or facial or body hair, you know, and, and so it's gosh darn, it's just, it's really, it's really tricky. And, and as a mental health provider, um, I think it's critical. And there's a ton of data that, that says this also is, is that um, it, once you, once, when somebody starts experiencing physical dysphoria related to their secondary sex characteristics, it's really challenging to roll that dysphoria back. It's really, really hard if you have dysphoria about some part of your body. Um, it's certainly, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think it's pretty challenging therapeutically to find some sort of pathway or identify something that does not include a medical intervention to treat, effectively treat that source of dysphoria. So. The other advantageous thing about blockers is, is that it really effectively um, prevents some, some aspects, not all, but some aspects of dysphoria um, from ever developing, um, which means that you're also then preventing some really critical um, mental health challenges from, from developing. And so it's always, it's always strategic decisions, right? Aiden was just talking about, and we experienced a lot of that. So um, it's really great to see that there's more doctors, um, more gynecologists, more surgeons addressing this. We live, uh, as you know, up in a rural area. And one of the things that once we put our daughter on blockers, it was really crucial that we kept up with, the, with um, blood work to check the vitamin D, to check her bone density and all that. And it was such a challenge getting back and forth to the Bay Area. Um, and we had good insurance and we were lucky. We could do it, we could swing it. Um, but that that's another really big piece because she did, um, she does have low vitamin D and it's been a worry and we have to keep up on that. But that was also something possibly gen genetically with her beforehand. Um, but. I guess I'm just stressing stay up on the stay up on the blood work and um, follow through with your appointments with your doctor to make sure that um, you know just health wise you're really taking care of your your body your son your daughter um, yourself. So that's just a thought I had. Thank you, Julie, for adding that. Uh, the next question I just posted in the chat, I am a trans minor. How much medical and mental health services can I access without needing my parents' permission first? I can chime in here at least about the mental health piece from what I understand. Um, so it does kind of depend on the state from what I understand in the state of California, if you're above the age of 12 years old and you're deemed, um, uh, what is it, deemed, um, lost the word, mature enough <laughs> to kind of make decisions, um, you can engage in mental health services. Um, beyond that wording, it seems actually pretty vague. So it's kind of, <laughs> kind of dependent on your relationship with the provider and, you know, what you're seeking services for. Um, certainly, you know, therapy, I can imagine would fall within there. Um, and then writing letters. I haven't had someone approach me who is around the age of 12 looking for a letter for themselves. Usually their parents are on board, which is amazing. Um, been so grateful for that. But um, 
you know, to me, that would really be like, I'm, my job is simply just to determine if this person does not have a mental health disorder at the time to prevent them from, you know, getting the services that they need. So whether it's hormones or whatever else is necessary for them. So the way that I would see that is, yeah, if they meet that, you know, if they meet that minimum, I suppose I would be like, yeah, I don't see what the problem would be. Um, certainly if, you know, the sports, some sort of sports are involved, help, um, you know, help with the success of whatever treatments and whatever is going on in their life, of course. So. I think briefly seconding what you just shared, Dr. Steele, around, um, you know, 12 is the age of minor informed consent in California. So along with mental health care, you can consent to a variety of different um, medical and reproductive health care decisions in California. For um, trans affirming medical care, I feel like in my experience, at least in our area in Chico, is it's been kind of provider by provider at what age they'll begin um, providing uh, treatment options. Um, and also, um, you know, whether that's that parental consent piece changes that too. And from what I've heard from our local providers is largely that's been navigating safety concerns, right? When there are visible changes in your body, um, is there a safety plan in place for um, your home life and um, planning around that? Um, but specific ages, and please others chime in. I've seen it vary. I know some providers um, won't provide uh, trans-affirming care until 18 in our area, some won't 16, and obviously with puberty blockers, you want that before um, or at the beginning stages of puberty, ideally. Um, but I've seen that vary quite a bit in our Chico area. So it's, um, uh, I'll speak first more mental health and, and um, to, to tag along with Dr. Steele that um, similar, you know, 12 across the board is certainly somebody has the ability to provide um, consent as a private practice clinician doesn't happen very often because 12 year olds generally don't have the financial resources to, to pay for therapy and that often um, actually presents as the is more of a barrier frequently um, and transportation, etc. Although Zoom has changed our world quite a bit as it relates to that. Um, the, the challenge that I find with that is, is not that young person's ability to engage in a meaningful way in, in therapy. Um, what I have found to be more challenging is as that person is having an, a, hopefully an affirming therapeutic experience, part of what affirmation does is that it, 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 it makes people want to pursue, pursue further affirmation, right? Like that, that thing is like, oh, this feels better. Can I do some more of this? And if that young person's engaging in therapy and their parents, guardians, caregivers, or whoever it is that's taking care of them don't know, you, you can accidentally create um, sort of a, a therapeutic tension in that young person wanting something that that family um, doesn't know about and is unable to provide. And, and so you can unintentionally actually increase dysphoria. So it's not to say that I wouldn't, but I think that there's a lot of really critical strategic conversations so that that young person um, isn't sort of lingering in this kind of um, limbo of like, I'm going to therapy and getting affirmation and support, but I can't do anything with it, right? Like that's actually problematic to like them not. And so for me as a social worker, what that means is, is that my job as a, as a clinical social worker certainly exists within those 50 minutes of that, that um, clinical relationship. But my job also really far and exceeds outside of that 50 minutes. My job also includes engaging with parents and caregivers. My job also includes engaging with school districts. It also includes engaging with medical providers and other mental health providers. So like from a practice perspective, that's how I manage that. And that's, that's how I deal with that. Um, and, and um, you know, sometimes it works out swimmingly and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and, and I have found that sometimes um, if parents have or caregivers or guardians um, have some information, but also really critically some psychoeducation, right? So if they're, if, if, if I can get that, that young person to consent and there being an exchange of information between myself and their parents, guardians, or caregivers, and they can get some information, oftentimes the parent, caregiver, or guardian will then provide consent for that young person to engage in treatment. But when you're 12, it's really hard to sort of like, there's a large belief of like, my parents don't understand and they're never going to support me. And it's like, 
maybe, but also have you told them anything, you know? And, and so sometimes it's just a gap of, of information and, and communication that I think I can help with. Um, again, I'm not a doctor, um, but um, my understanding um, is that, and, and I actually feel really confident about this. It's not just my understanding is that um, in order to engage in uh, trans affirming medical care, pubertal suppression, um, hormone related medication, and certainly surgery, that anyone to the age of 18 has to have parental consent to do so. Um, um, and in a scenario in which uh, there are two parents who are part of that household and those parents are legally married, regardless of the gender makeup, only one parent has to provide consent. That other parent can say, I don't support this, you know, or, or whatever. Um, largely, if there's a disagreement, one parent will stay silent and the other person will provide consent and then they have to work that out, out within their relationship. If parents are divorced or never married and both parents are in the picture, both parents have to provide consent for all medical intervention. And so there's some, um, it, it's not just one thing, it sort of depends upon the family makeup of it, um, but it's 18 for all medical, uh, transition related medical care. And, and that's across the country, it's United States. I can add too that even with parental support, any surgical procedure that results in sterilization isn't performed before what's called the age of consent, which is um, 18 for private insurance and 21 for public insurance, um, which has been challenging when patients are younger than that and have support and want a surgery and where our hands get a little bit tied in that regard, um, or in cases where patients are offering to, to pay without insurance and then we have, you know, governing bodies or higher upset that follow these more traditional guidelines and, and might, might not make exceptions, but the general rule is anything re resulting in sterilization would be 18 or 21. Dr. Bonington, have you heard that the new standards of care that are coming out, they're dropping the age for vaginoplasty to 17? It's in written word now. I heard, Just, yeah, I heard yeah. talks of that. We don't tend to change anything. And yeah. until and then, unfortunately, insurance is never going to update as soon as um, as yeah. soon as the guidelines change. And we're we're ninety nine percent insurance based. Um, sure. And so, we're happy to do that if it changes. But we we're, our hands are a bit tied before that. I have another question here in the chat. What options do I have regarding official documents when it comes to gender labels? Um, I can start this one off. Um, in terms of changing gender la labels or legal name changes, um, in the state of California, you can receive a court order and change a birth certificate or driver's license to three options, male, female, or non-binary. Um, in terms of age and that process, it's a lot easier now than it used to be. Um, you no longer need a lawyer. You don't have to publish publicly. You won't need letters. In most cases, you won't have to see a judge. Um, if you are under the age of 18, um, the uh, smoothest way through the process is with both with all parents with legal rights um, over you signing the paperwork to change the legal name and gender marker change. Um, if you are unable um, to receive those signatures from parents, there are technical ways to move forward, but it gets a little bit complicated and includes essentially um, providing proof of service and serving your parents um, that this is a choice you're making and then you would need a hearing. Um, but in terms of changing, um, anyone can get legal name and gender marker changes, whether they're um, um, a citizen or not, whether foster care or not, whether they're um, above or below 18, it just changes a little bit depending on your specific situation. And if you're only, sorry, just add, and if you're only interested in changing a gender marker on a um, driver's license or California state ID, you can actually do that without a court order. So you can fill out, it's a pretty easy half sheet um, and turn it into the DMV and then we'll change it um, day of and you don't need any further documentation. I actually had a bit of my own question <laughs> for this because um, I work with a lot of insurances and some clients that I work with do identify and 
have been labeled on their driver's license as non-binary or X or like whatever they can choose, of course, that resonates with them. And yet insurance seems to really want that sex marker <laughs> to be able to, um, or denote denotation, I suppose, to be able to bill for them. So I wasn't sure if there's any way around that as a provider. Like I know this is for everybody as well or working with that. As a fellow clinician, I can just tell you what, what I do. Um, it's, you're right because insurance companies largely follow ICD and ICD is not particularly trans competent or sometimes caring it seems. Um, and so um, I will through a very informed conversation with my clients say like, here's the situation. Um, these are the two options, which feels not best but which feels less harmful for you. Um, and then I will always put a note, I mean, obviously most things are like, I will always put a note to the person receiving the insurance claim that this person identifies as non-binary and does not identify with these two options. Um, and just so that it's this constant sort of like low level education, right? So, so that hopefully at least somebody on the other end recognizes, or if there's ever um, engagement with the client, maybe I've slightly increased the possibility of a more gender affirming situation um but but uh, there's been only a few times that i've been able to like not mark anything and it seems like you know one out of about 25 or 30 times somehow it'll slip through but most of the time it gets kicked back as i'm sure you know so um eclinical works has updated their gender identities and we have um non-binary trans male and trans female but it doesn't change what insurance asks for, but it changes what's in my note. And I do the same thing with constant um, reaffirmation of pronouns um, and will actually correct them when I have a conversation with them about the patient. So low level education. Uh, moving on from uh, more medical, less medical questions, these uh, seem to be from folks who have uh, more personal antidotes, the next following questions. And I just put it in the chat. I feel that my social anxiety has increased immensely since I've come out as trans. This has left me feeling isolated and separated from my friends. Do you have any recommendations on what I can do in order to help with these feelings? Is it is it Dr. Steele and I the only mental health providers? I just want to understand who's who's with us here. Is that accurate? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I, a, I want to just like I want to really validate that that um, I I very much both clinically, but I think also probably more importantly personally, really really resonate with with that question. Um, so. I think that there's a couple of things that um, make sense as to why that happens. Um, and, and so there's, I don't know how you are and you please feel free to share. And if you don't want to share, that, that's absolutely fine as well. But, um, you know, there's such a buildup for a lot of folks around the process of even recognizing um, that you're trans or you're non-binary, your gender is different than your designated sex at birth. And oftentimes that process is not widely shared with people. Um, sometimes maybe it's shared online a little bit, but, but more often than not, it's, it's much more of a, of a solitary or private process. Um, and so in that private process, there, there actually is anxiety that is like, like building and it's slowly building and it's building. And oftentimes it's, it's anxiety or associated feelings that um, are the driving force that actually um, lead to somebody disclosing that they're trans or non-binary or not cisgender. It's oftentimes like the anxiety that actually causes that, right? And so once you have named that, um, you've named it with, with people who maybe feel um, 
you're not sure if, if they're going to be providing support, right? That, that oftentimes, you know, our friends or people that we select very specifically that we know are going to be supportive and affirming um, our, our anxiety relationship to those folks are often different than maybe our anxiety relationship to um, parents or families um, or people at school or people who, who you're less certain about how their response is going to be. Um, but um, the anxiety also increases in the sense that this thing that sort of you held private, maybe for a short amount of time or maybe for you know a long amount of time, has, has now been externalized. And, and that's part of the reason why you feel more anxious is because now the anxiety is also being externalized. But I also, I also think that um, one of the things that, that happened for me, and, and again, that I've seen happen with a lot of clients is um, a, lot, a lot more becomes uncertain, right? There's just a ton of uncertainty of like, if I go into this space, um, are they going to read me as my gender? Are they going to read me differently? What name are they going to use? What pronoun are they going to use? Are they talking behind my back? Are they right? Like, there's all sorts of which I call gender dysphoria noise. It's it's all of the stuff as trans and non-binary people we experience um, in our in our brains and in our bodies and in our experience and and all of those things um, feel anxiety provoking uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty and and there's also uncertainty um, frequently about what does this mean? What does this mean about my future? What does this mean around accessing care? If I want to access it, am I going to be able to access it? Right. There's, there's just so many more questions that often don't have answers or feel like they don't have answers after that disclosure. Um, and so I think that, that one of the things that, that, that you can do, um, obviously is figuring out like for you, like, um, where are the places and the spaces that maybe you find you do you feel less anxious? I believe or that there's, as a trans person, that there's no anxiety. I've never experienced that place. If it exists, awesome, but it's not a place that I'm familiar with. Um, and so if there's places where, you know, you recognize that you feel less anxious, less anxious, less anxious right? You have supportive friends or you're in those spaces, um, you know, like really pursue those spaces as much as you possibly can. And, and if you find that you are less anxious on online you know, forums in, in Discord or Reddit or, or online friends, right? If those are places that you feel less anxious, um, I'm a big advocate of, of being in those spaces too, um, that uh, barring medical intervention or social intervention or legal intervention, if that's what you want, um, you know, those things will obviously help anxiety as well, but you may be in a situation where you, you can't access those things. You can't pursue those things, um, until, until later. Um, but so those are some of the things, but I think the most important thing is I just, I just really want to validate that feeling or those feelings, um, that is real. And I think that it is common and it's shared amongst family members, like trans and non-binary community members, that it's, that it's a very familiar feeling. And, and I will say it, it super sucks. It, 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 it really sucks. So um, thank you for just even naming it and bringing it into the space. I appreciate that. Maybe it comes with the training, but I certainly wanted to validate initially too. I mean, it's such, it's what came to mind is like uncharted territory for everybody involved sometimes. Um, and what I do know, I don't have necessarily personal experience, but what I absolutely know is it's so hard to shift ideas that we have in our head sometimes. That's why I'm in the field that I'm in. Um, and it can be hard on both sides. So I can, I certainly hear people who do identify as transgender and coming out to the people that they love. And there's a lot of shoulds. I should feel this way. It should feel better, um, whatever it is. And on the other end too, um, you know, they should treat me this way. And I think that's the one thing that I certainly love um two two things come to mind one is from glennon doyle she just talks about how like ooey gooey and like you know like how anxiety can just feel so wrong and yet it makes you to be able to push through that and do the brave things sometimes um in a safe way of course and then I think it was you, Aiden, a while ago at, um, <laughs> it was at a couple of trans weeks ago, um, years ago, but certainly saying like, if you have friends who need to like push you through it or just stand beside you or stand in front of you or stand in back of you as you're going through this process, like there's no wrong way to, you know, have this process. And it's always going to feel very strange, I think at first, or maybe even mixed. 
Um, but to, yeah, to be able to even normalize that for ourselves and also to val get validation from others. So I think certainly, you know, going to the places that you do feel the safest, um, trying out like over advocating for myself and then, you know, under advocating and like in these safe ways, like figuring out how do I need to be and communicate with people in order to manage my, yeah, my own anxiety. Um, and then sometimes I just validate for people like it's not, it's certainly not the perfect world to come out at all. So, you know, maybe, yeah. So just kind of knowing that sometimes is like, yeah, it's certainly hard out there. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to chime in briefly and say how impressed I am that you asked that question, that you were able to formulate that question and be brave enough to ask um, for help and recommendations. That's just, that's incredible. Um, you'll, you'll find your allies, you'll find your friends. You're obviously a strong, articulate, bright person. Um, which is probably also why you feel these feelings so much. Um, but pushing through is a great thought about, um, you know, just pushing through in the sense that you, your strength will, will carry you through this and you will find um, other strong people like you who are like-minded and have hearts like yours. And um, just, just, just keep pushing through that. Um, they're, they're out there and you're obviously on the right track and already seeking help. I'm not sure what your age is or your gender, but I'm very impressed. Uh, thank you, panelists. I know a lot of these questions um, are vague. Uh, we used a submission process that was completely anonymous. And so the hopes are that those who need to hear these words will access them. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't give you much more than that, but just know that that was part of the process. Another question here in the chat. Uh, how can people who love me be against me having any type of gender affirming surgery? How can I make them understand? I think, um, again, from my own experience, just working clinically with families and all different roles of, you know, people and families is um, there's a lot of fear. Definitely, there's a lot of fear that someone will get even more hurt or even more whatever it is that they're feeling. There's a fear that, you know, that people are misguided too. And um you know, I wonder too if there's, well, there's certainly a piece of privilege that comes out of people who perhaps identify as a gender, you know, as the sex that they were born as, I suppose, so cisgendered, um, you know, and that sometimes what I'll challenge people is like, have you ever had a question a day in your life, you know, about your own gender, felt like you, it wasn't what, you know, what you initially Dr. Steele, I think you froze. I mean, oh, it my you're back on. on. We can hear you again. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> of course. Um, so yeah, I, am, I mean, there's just, I guess there's a lot of reasons that that can happen, but certainly I think education has been very powerful. A lot of times when I refer families to the Stonewall Center, even to Marin specifically, um, you know, they feel pretty empowered and just like less fearful of not knowing things in general. So the more answers we have, sometimes it is easier to be able to manage what, whatever those answers are, so. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I think that um, I, I love working with parents and guardians and caregivers um, and, and clinicians who work within the trans and non-binary communities. 
um, there tends to be kind of a divide between folks who really enjoy working with parents and then folks who don't really enjoy working with parents. And, and I somehow found my, myself on, on uh, certainly on one side. Um, I think that what I have seen is to Dr. Steele's point, um, there's, there's not enough, people lack information. Um, and when, when people don't have information, particularly if it's about something that um, it's not very relatable to them, or maybe what they relate to feels um, different than how they understand you, right? Because there's media that presents um, information that is often or largely inaccurate um, or slanted in a particular way. And I think parents and gar uh, guardians and caregivers, um, they see that information because it's, it's easy to digest. And then they try to like figure out how does that, how do I make sense with that on the, my, on my kid that, that I love, right? And, and that's, that's hard. Um, and I think that um, most of the time, what I have found working with parents is what looks like not acceptance. Um, what I have often found behind that is paralyzing fear, um, tons of uncertainty, um, all sorts of, you know, all sorts of things. And, and, and the thing that is ironic or interesting is that a lot of times what parents and guardians and caregivers are feeling um, are often the very same things that as trans people, we once felt also, right? That, that when I was talking a little bit before about the coming in where there's like, you know, it's kind of private or only a handful of people know, and then there's the, the coming out or sort of the disclosure, right? And then more people know that as soon as you tell those other people, those people start their coming in process of like, ah, what the heck is this? What's going on? And uh, now I'm on Google and Reddit and what, right? And, and so that, that process of, what does this mean? And now I understand what it means. I'm going to do something replicates itself over and over and over. Um, but if you aren't able to get, if one isn't able to get information, then they can get stuck. They can get stuck in that educational process, right? The other thing is, um, I think that is, as, as a clinical field, um, we don't always do such a great job um, supporting parents and gar guardians and caregivers. And, and and I want to be very clear that I'm not interested in supporting somebody who's not supporting their kid, but I am super interested in supporting somebody to figure out how to get to the place of supporting their kid. I'm 100% in, no matter how long that takes, with that process. And so there are you know, a lot of online spaces where parents can safely engage with other parents, guardians, and caregivers where they can share their fears and share their concerns, but also receive information from other parents. Because as medical providers, as clinicians, as, as you know, everyone who's in this room that carries your own perspective and expertise, um, in, unless you are, which I think there are people in this call who are, unless you have this overlap of also being a parent, right? The, the um, parent to parent or caregiver, caregiver, that conversation, often is much more impactful than a professional speaking, speaking to a parent, right? Oftentimes, the more experience you have as a, as a provider working with trans and non-binary people, that you can, you can be even less valid with what you're saying to a parent because um, it doesn't resonate for that parent. So I, I appreciate, you know, Justine saying like the, the vagueness and the amenity of these questions. Some of them, though, are going to be, you know, dependent upon a variety of different circumstances. At the end of the day, you're, it sounds like in a situation or scenario, for whatever reason, the people around you, the people who you love and who love you, um, you don't feel supported by. And, and maybe it, maybe you feel unloved by, or, you know, there's, there's a plethora of things. Um, and I, I will say that um, I don't believe it is your job to educate. I don't believe that it is your job to carry that weight. I don't believe that it is your burden um, uh, you know, your cross to, to bear. That doesn't mean that you're not profoundly impacted because you obviously are. But one of the things that, that may be much more advantageous for you is, is there's just tremendous resources at, at Stonewall. There's tremendous resources all over the country that are accessible online so that um, your parents or caregivers or whoever it is can get the information they need so that they can move so that you can move. Um, but you probably don't have the information that they are looking for at this point. Um, because that's generally not how the communication goes around gender affirming care. It just rarely does. So.
Yeah, echoing a little bit of that in my work, um, supporting different trans youth, trans adults, working in a lot of schools, I get different versions of this question a lot of how can I convince my parents to love or accept me or how do I get them to understand like who I am and what I'm going through. Um, and just like Aiden said, I, I, my answer is also, you know, that's not necessarily work for you to do. It's not your job to convince the people you love and that love you on how to love you and yet sometimes we're put in those roles um i think that really is community work right looking at the larger sphere available to you of therapists of providers of um advocates willing to do that work with your parents right not being the person necessarily in that role but recognizing um people things uh networks within your community that can play that role um because sometimes it's it's not a conversation between you and that person um but maybe between that person and someone else that will really kind of push and move that space for them um something else that i like to touch on a little bit when i am working um with people trying to learn how to support trans folks, um, whether that's parents or people that love them, um, is really kind of flipping and challenging this golden rule idea, right? A lot of us grew up being told, treat others how you wanna be treated. Um, and I like to challenge that and say, you know, treat others how they wanna be treated. Oftentimes what we need for respect and dignity and care looks so different person to person. And so instead of necessarily that parent or that person getting to a place where they understand everything you're going through, getting to a place where they can accept and meet you where you're at, even when they don't understand or don't need the same things, right? Some people won't need surgery to feel good in their body. Some do. And being able to get to a point where like, okay, even if I can't understand this, I see this is what you need to feel safe and respected and good right now. Um, and then I've had Actually, you know, within our community, I've seen some success in working with parents for long enough where they get to a point where they're open to talking to another provider. Um, some of those providers are on this call where once the parent is willing to get in a room with a physician or a doctor or a therapist, that next level conversation has been really impactful in answering those fears and talking about risks and benefits. Um, and those have really been um, shifting in transitional moments. One thing I'll add too, I'm not sure if the question was supposed to be really specific about surgery, but I definitely have seen it where a patient has all the support of their friends and family and they support name changes, outfit changes, stuff like that. But then surgery becomes a different line where there's a permanence to it um, and an irreversibility at times that I'm not the person necessarily to help them navigate that, but it's definitely a dynamic I've seen too, where they've had all the support and then all of a sudden you know, well, not so much for surgery. Let's wait on that. Let's make sure we're certain of our choices or whatever, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think to add to that too, is I know there's been a lot of families who don't realize that there are steps in the middle too. I mean, even something like negotiating, you know, if I'm thinking like of my, like a minor, for example, but even negotiating, like wearing the clothes that you want to wear, even if there's no other procedures or anything that's kind of done, you know, and kind of taking the steps to be able to, yeah, certainly get the respect and the safety that you need. And, you know, I think just also what you said, Marin, I really appreciated it. What I'm writing down in my notes is like, my happiness isn't necessarily your happiness, right? Like I really, cause I can imagine people also have said like, well, if they ever want a child, I want them to have a child, you know? Like, you know, I'm not sure that their mind is even there yet if they really can't imagine being alive the next moment, right? Or whatever, like having them feel safe and having the happiness, the deep happiness, not the jo just joy or, you know, whatever. Um, be there. I think it can be really important. So, I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Bonington, um, if that's okay, just to sort of offshoot from something he's brought up recently. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. So I I am curious since since you know you guys do a ton of these every every week. Um, how how do you guys handle when patients come back um, months, years later, um, asking for a reversal? 
Yeah, I don't know if we've encountered that, to be honest. I think um, specifically for, for what we do, which is mostly vaginoplasty surgery, um, there isn't a great reversal and it's not a surgery that we could, we could do to create, you know, do a phalloplasty. Um, mm -hmm. We, and you know, one of the questions that gets brought up a lot is the question of regret and how often regret happens. And we tell them honestly of our, you know, I think we're at like 500 patients. We've had one patient regret their surgery and it wasn't because they weren't sure of their gender or they weren't sure that they wanted the procedure. Um, it just didn't have the outcome that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And that alone was like, well, I don't know if I'm any better off necessarily, but they didn't change their identity. They just weren't happy that they went through with the surgery. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I can't answer it better because we unfortunately, you know, fortunately haven't experienced that. And I think this idea of maybe you, maybe for other procedures, you see it more often, but we just, we just haven't so much in our clinic. Is this something that you see more for the, the top surgeries? Well, um, yeah, frankly, I've only had it, had one patient come back recently. Um, and it's, you know, not to get into the specifics, but it's been interesting to navigate um, just because the patient is rather young. Um, but it is definitely surfacing more in my conversations with other plastic surgeons um, who do top surgery in that it is, um, it presents a, an interesting challenge, but also just from a insurance standpoint and how to, to navigate those things. So um, there are no, there's no, there are no guidelines so far, um, but I do think it's something that a lot of people uh, considering um, surgery really worry about and, and parents, you know, the permanency. So I really appreciate that you brought this topic up because I, you know, we'll see how things come down the pike. Thank you. Um, next question just dropped in the chat here. If you could give the advice, sorry, if you could give the parents of a trans child one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, I'm the parent of a transgender daughter. So uh, one piece of advice that I was given that was super helpful was to listen and listen, 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 because as a parent, you're so used to, especially when they're younger, guiding and suggesting and putting things out there. But of course, with the transgender child and being cisgender myself, um, I can't speak to that experience. So I had to learn to really, really listen in a different way than just being uh, a parent of a cisgender person because my experience, I, I, I can't, it's just a whole different experience in life. So um, once I did that, once I really, really listened and followed her, um, just followed where she was going, what she was facing in terms of anxiety, in terms of depression, in terms of um, societal um, rejection, friends, schools, all that, just listen to her and let go of my agenda. And I had an agenda for sure, because that's what parents do. You know, they, they foresee the future and, and that's what we do as humans. We plan, we think about things we want to do. We, we, um, we have a vision. So that would be my one piece of advice is to really, really, truly listen to what they need, um, what they want to do and be there for them. Yeah, I would, I would definitely, I would definitely echo that for sure. Um, and um, I think I appreciate you truly saying that it's that it's listening in a different way. It's listening sometimes in a way that is new and unfamiliar and quite uncomfortable. And and so um, being being willing to be uncomfortable as a parent or guardian or caregiver um, uh, in the in with the goal or the hopes is that. Um, your child isn't bearing the brunt of your discomforts, right? Like that's really, I think that's a really critical piece because 
now you have some, you have an additional um, issue or, or additional problem that's going to have to be unraveled. Um, so, so you think that listening, but, but also um, making sure that you're getting support, making sure that you're creating a network and creating a community because um, it is unlikely, possible, but it is unlikely that you're going to have a naturally built in a network, friend network or support network, or even family um, network of, of, of people who, who are parenting a trans or non-binary kid. It's certainly possible, but generally that's not how it works, right? And, and so, you know, and I'm a parent and so like, to, that was not a good light turning on situation right there that just happened. Um, so typically, um, you know, when as a parent, if, you know, I have a 15 year old and when my 15 year old does certain things, like I will go to other parents of 15 year olds and I'm like, is this a thing? And I'm like, yes, it's a thing. And I'm like, oh, thank God it's a thing. Right. But when you're parenting a trans or non-binary kid, you're probably not going to automatically have somebody who is also parenting a trans or non-binary kid. So it's critical that um, you, you get connected so that you can get your own peer support. It's really, it's really important, but also remember um, that uh, there's so much around supporting and affirmation of your trans or non-binary kid that is not permanent. The distance of not permanent is actually really much larger, um, particularly early on than the amount of space that is permanent. And so um, if you can think about like, you know, name change and pronoun change and hair change and clothing change and all of these different things, while uncomfortable and challenging and maybe bring up a lot of painful feelings of loss and confusion and grief and anger and sometimes even embarrassment, right? Um, all, of, all of those things are things that you as a parent, you can totally do. As parents, we do, we do way more challenging things than those things. We do really hard things every single day. Um, and that if calling your child a different name and listening to them about what they need and what they want, particularly when it's in that realm of, of reversible, um, it, uh, it's critical. It's really, really Im important. Um, and, and so I would say like lean in. When I talk to parents, I'm like, the, when you have a proclivity to lean out, that's when you should lean in, right? Like it's, it's counterintuitive sometimes of like, oh, I don't want to do this. And it's like, oh, no, no, that's, that's when you got to do, you have to lean in. Um, but, but I think, uh, parents getting support from other parents um, is critical. I think adding to what you said too is, um, I think the one thing, or not, one of the other things I'd wanna say certainly is grief, grieve and it's okay to grieve. And it's not your, it may not necessarily be part of your child's um, process to grieve necessarily. I mean, there certainly might be pieces that come up like social groups or whatever. Um, but it's okay to grieve and it's okay to get support for that grief. And, um, you know, and that's going to be your own process. And yeah, I think everything else people had said, which I really appreciate. Hi, this is Dawn. I am the mom of a transgender son. And, you know, when um, he came out to us, it was, um, you know, there was a lot of feelings. I think grief was the first one and just really working through that. And fortunately, we had a lot of resources in place. And and in those first months, it was just reminding myself to give myself a little bit of grace and patience and also giving my son the same amount of grace and patience that we didn't maybe always have the answer, but we can always talk through it, work through it. And, um, you know, we've always been, you know, both my husband and I are nurses and we have, um, my husband's a mental health nurse. And so we've always put a lot of focus on, on mental health and, and the importance of, you know, going, you know, seeing the therapist and really working through processes with the therapist and not the fluffy stuff. And, um, really just having those good conversations and, um, and knowing that we won't always have the answer, you know, as two healthcare professionals, we always want to have the answer and, you know, always have the plan. I think somebody mentioned it before, like seeing that future and, um, you know, there's, it's like different things each set of months, you know, the first few months, it's the grief of this human that you, that you gave birth to and their name and their gender and your plan and your vision. And then, um, you know, then doing some sort of, um, transition, you know, whether it's medications or whatever that looks like, you know, it's just these different phases that you're going through all the time. Um, but we've always been very, very 
pro mental health and focusing on what those needs are. I mean, we've been to crisis, we've been in behavioral health, we've we've done all of those things and we never put a stigma on it. We always treat it like we would with any other medical condition as, as it is a medical condition and really just offer the support that's needed and hope and then come out on the other side and be happy with what what transpired and what we learned and and again I just end with patience and grace you know my husband has a heck of a time with pronouns and I just keep saying just offer him a little patience and grace we'll get there <laughs> and he finally did so um but I, I think what Julie said is you know listening communication and 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 leaning in I really appreciated Aiden you know I um my husband's also going through cancer treatment and and, you know, he'll sometimes they'll say, you know, well, I don't really want to talk about like that right now, or I don't want to do that. And I said, well, sometimes the hardest things to do are the things that we need to do. We need, we need to push into that. We need to, to work through those things. If it's hard, it's, it, there's a reason we need to go through that. So just offering that space for it. No, we don't always have all the answers. Thank you. I'm going to share a resource um, because I know that the grief or experiences of grief and loss um, often come up um, and and I don't always think I think it can be murky and I think it can be sort of confusing like the, the duality of, of the feelings of grief and like feelings of loss that happen while simultaneously having somebody who's physically present often sort of you're engaging in, in conversation and, and so I think that can be um, challenging and I also think that as trans and non-binary folks it can be painful for us to hear that people are grieving our loss when we often feel like the best that we can possibly be after sharing this. So Dr. Pauline Boss, um, she many, many years ago um, kind of came up with a framework of its ambiguous loss. And, and the origins of ambiguous loss um, was about something that's not at all trans related, um, but really it's, it's evolved into this place of it's sort of unresolved um, grief and loss, right? And I think that, that parents of trans and non-binary kids of all ages, I would say, sort of um, have um, acute feelings of grief and loss that are often like right at the beginning, um, as Don, you were saying, it's like the names and the pronouns and maybe it's the shifting um, presentation or Julie, it's, you know, whatever it was, like um, I, it's, to Dr. Steele's point, it's, it's very common, but I also think that there's opportunities for information and frameworks that, that both simultaneously validate those experiences, but also really support somebody um, to not get stuck there, like to be able to like feel it and validate it create a framework for it, understand it, um, so that they can get to um, a, a place of integrating this new information um, that feels better for them and feels better for the people around them. So ambiguous loss, it's, it's, it's these two principles, right? So it's when somebody's physically present, but they feel psychologically absent, right? It's this incomplete loss, or the um, alternative is that they're psychologically present, but physically absent. And I think that is, um, I think that can be applied at different places around transition in different understandings of people's gender and gender identity. Um, so it can be a really helpful model. So it's Dr. Pauline Boss and it's ambiguous loss. Okay, I am going to cut the questions a bit to the last one here so that we can, um, we do have a follow up question as well that I want to give some time for for that person on the call. Uh, the okay, I think I'm all set. Can you all hear me? Okay. Great. Um, I do have to cut some of the questions due to timing. I apologize in advance for that, uh, but I feel that this one is a great one to kind of wrap up our discussion on. What advice do you have for allies who want to use their cisgender privilege to actively support the trans community? Okay, I'm gonna be brave and take a stab at this. <laughs> um, so obviously I was trained as OBGYN. I was trained only to do women's healthcare. Actually, ACOG came out with a statement saying that we were only allowed to treat women. Um, and one of the things that we did as some of us in the OBGYN community did is we voiced our, um, distaste for that rule 
to the American College of OBGYN and it was reversed um, to some degree, but um, you know, they basically said that we couldn't treat any non-female patients for a while. Um, so I, that was, I guess, my first statement about being um, pro the trans community. Um, but then I was asked by a member of the trans community how I felt about um, becoming an advocate and learning to do hormones. And I think that um, kind education is the best thing you can do to get allies. Um, angry education is frequently not helpful. Um, but when I was asked if I would be willing to use my knowledge, you know, for the good, specifically the mental health good of the trans community, it was really hard to not want to be part of it. Um, so I, I won't call myself an, an expert, but I will say I am an advocate. Um, and I think that people feel limited uh, in what they can do. And I had a very, very wise teacher say to me once, don't let what you can't do prevent you from doing what you can do. So all of us have something to contribute. Is it, you know, that we make sure to tell our kids from a very early age in life that we don't care what their gender or sexual orientation is and that we don't care what their friend's gender and sexual orientation is so that it becomes almost a joke in my family that it's disappointing I got all cisgender kids. Um, but I like that my children all say things like that and that my daughter grew up and she asked for specialty training in her residency to do uh, transgender hormones. And that is not something internal medicine teaches. So I think kindly being educated by the community is what really helped me. And now I continue to gently push pretty much everyone I know to be accepting as well. So that's my two cents. That was brave. I think what was going through my head is like, oh no, am I doing it right? <laughs> sort of, but um, certainly I think listening, um, asking a very open end question and being open to whatever is said back and not judging, you know, um, we don't know have we don't have to know the why of things to be able to benefit people. So um, I trust that people know what they need and therefore, you know, I, kind of take that at face value of like, that's what they need and that's what I'm going to do for them. So um, I think that, but I think also even, you know, when I'm the only one who is an ally or as close to, um, you know, this population as I can, as, as anyone else in the group to be able to speak up. So, you know, when relatives are saying jokes that have been said for you know, a long time for years and years to be able to speak up about it and say like, that's actually not really appropriate, you know, or whatever it is. Um, or I think they prefer they, them, or, you know, and, you know, I, I know a lot of people come back like with sarcasm sometimes or whatever it is. And what I do is again, I kind of take it at face value. Like they're like, Oh, that's everybody nowadays. I'm like, actually, no, like coming out with like the research or whatever, just, kind of answering straight out, like, no, this, this is actually what is going on. And so, I mean, that's the way that I kind of handle my own allyship and try to encourage others or not try to encourage others, but certainly tell others that's what's worked for me so far. Hi, this is Don. Um, you know, I've just been focusing on our home. You know, we are a very affirming home and we have lots of friends that come over and, um, you know, my most, you know, makes me cry every time I think about it is one of the friends came over and asked directly, you know, what's your preferred name and pronouns. And they nearly just started bawling. Their mom are, their mom is not accepting and doesn't call them by their preferred name. And, 
And I was like, well, that's all I, I, I just need to make them feel safe here. You know, I don't have to do something big or grand. I can just stay within my circle and feel good about the little, the little things I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis to support our young humans and as they navigate through this. Yeah, I think that um, what, if we were to, to replace the word privilege, it would be power, right? That's what privilege is. It's, it's power um, and it's and it's and so it's access to resources it's access to spaces it's access to voices right like privilege and power is, is about access and so thinking about the places that as a cis person you have privilege slash power slash access right and and using that power and that access um, to benefit uh, those who you wish to be in allyship with in this case, the trans and non-binary community, but but there are so many oppressed and marginalized communities around us that that so desperately need allies to use their privilege. Um, and, and and I think the most powerful way of being an ally it very rarely actually includes the trans or non-binary person, whoever it is that you're you're doing allyship on behalf of. Allyship really, um, from my perspective anyway, um, certainly from an anti-oppressive perspective, is about the work that that we do and and maybe even the people we're doing the work on behalf of never knows like that's you know that's important role of allyship and so you know dr dixon you know if you're a medical provider anyone in this room is a medical provider you all as medical providers have an audience that certainly as a social worker i don't have but i as a social worker have an audience that you don't have also and as parents you have audiences that sometimes neither of us have right and so it's sort of looking about like who do I have access to? Who's in my community? You know, for Don, it's like, you know, I have access to kids who need something, right? And, and so really looking like, who do I have access with? Who do I have power? I mean, how do I use that power as leverage to create positive good or, or to create positive change for the folks who don't have access to that? Um, and it's really critical. And, and, I, and I will say that um, I appreciate both Dr. Dixon and, and you, Dr. Steele and, and Don as well, is, is, is I actually appreciate that, I do appreciate the hesitancy, um, not because I want you to feel uncomfortable, but because allyship is, in a, is appointed by the community in which you are in allyship with. It's not self-designated and it's not a lifetime appointment either, right? And, and so sort of thinking about like, it's about doing things so that the community is like, that person's an ally, like identifying you as an ally as opposed to like knock 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 I'm an ally right like um so it's 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 action oriented and there's an endless amount of things that you can do um small scale large scale um that is about using your power it's like superhero thing but using your power for the greater good of the community that you desire to positively impact Um, I just want to give a shout out to Stonewall. Um, I had them come to my office probably four years ago now, and they did a, um, a training with my staff, my office staff, and how to, um, and just went through, I think it was like three hours that they were there, just educating um, my staff in how to feel comfortable and to you know, we just kind of had an open forum sort of like this that people could talk through their um nervousness about addressing uh the transgender population population and it was um it was pivotal and we've carried those principles through um today so i just wanted to put a shout out there for education piece I would, I want to echo that, you know, um, about in the last year because of COVID, I'm the director of education at MLO and um, Marin and Jen Stofa with um, Public Health did an amazing compassion and action series for MLO and our caregivers um, over four weeks. And it was, it was such a impactful um, set of presentations and it really helped our community at MLO and wanted to add with Aiden, you know, you kind of forget your, your community that you're in, you know, I think about my child and I think about home and I have this other community at work and you know every opportunity that I have whether it's a, a project working on a policy related to SOGI or if it's you know you know gender identification and epic and you know those kind of things I always want to be involved and and speak to those things and what the real impact can be um, to the individual and and then offer stories on the other side as a patient you know and how well somebody did 
and using appropriate pronouns or using their um, preferred name um, because we have good policies in place. And so it's um, baby steps in all avenues. So thank you. One thing I think about too is, you know, I think a lot of us um, are in professions where we we know we're interacting with trans and non-binary people often, but I say to people who who think they don't that you know we everyone interacts with people with trans or non-binary identities, even if you don't know that they are, and so doing little things to just make sure that whatever space you're in is is welcoming, you know, would be that a little you know trans pride flag in your window of your store shop or in your service industry or something like that. Um, just in knowing that this is letting people know this is a safe space um, and then backing it up and making sure you're doing the work to, to ensure it is a safe space for the people who are coming into your, to your establishment. Okay, thank you everyone. That uh, wraps up our pre-called questions. Um, there were two centered on primary care doctors in Chico, um, one for an eight-year-old and one was for, I think, a young adult. Um, I think they're still on the line, if you can clarify that for me. It'd also be great if you shared any recommendations or resources or whatever the case may be, if you send them over to me either in the chat or by email. Um, I am going to compile this information and send it out as well. And so, as you know, this video recording will be out as well. Um, and so I'd love to send out some contacts uh, for people who are asking for them. I know Dr. Milliron, my daughter, Alyssa at Ampla does uh, internal medicine, but she doesn't take care of eight-year-olds. Um, so I don't know what pediatricians are supporters. I would think Lourdes Valdez, certainly, um, but I don't know specifically others. Yeah, um, there... I don't have a long list of pediatricians in our area. There are some trans-friendly primary care providers, Dr. Miller and being one. Um, there's a couple of providers at Argyle Medical Group um, that are trans-affirming. Um, I refer some folks to you, Dr. Dixon, when it applies. Um, and also um, Dr. Celeste Ranking um, is an amazing pediatrician. She is unfortunately almost always full. Um, she works with Northern Valley Indian Health. If you are um, Native and have a tribal role number, you can still get into Northern Valley Indian Health as a patient. Um, but for non-Native folks, I believe there's a waiting list still. Um, and I'll open the floor if anyone knows other pediatricians who are trans friendly. I just dropped one in the chat from Jen. Um, the chat should be open now to where you can message the group if that's easier. One thing I'll add to, it looks like a lot of um, telehealth services have expanded during the pandemic and it looks like they're gonna be fairly permanent um, in, certain, in terms of at least insurance coverage, which isn't always possible for, for new patients starting out, but it might be an option to find someone that's offering telehealth. Yeah, I, I know that um, the folks at Children's Hospital Los Angeles um, doing, to Dr. Bonnie, they're doing telehealth. Um, so much medicine can be done now. Um, not everything, obviously, but so much can be done via telehealth. I mean, people can get labs at their local labs and have it sent to their provider in other parts of the state. Um, and so uh, if locally where you are, there's just barriers, there's no access. And I think I read that maybe you had a negative experience. You know, UCSF is doing... Um, online care, CHLA down in Los Angeles doing online care, UCLA is doing online care, um, Cedar sinai is doing online care. Obviously, you know, going to LA is not ideal, but but it's also not ideal to have negative experiences, right? And, and so um, there's just a lot of, of resources um, 
because of COVID, unfortunately, because of COVID, but the fortunate is that so many more things are accessible now. Along with uh, panelists, if you want to drop your uh, contact information, if you're willing to be reached out, I did get a few questions from folks asking for specific contact info. Again, set that to everyone. Um, it'd be great to hear that or read that for folks asking. Um, I just shared it directly with Justina, but I'll, it's just as easy to, to share it openly. They, uh, there's a family support group in Los Angeles it's called Transforming Family. All of our meetings are online. It's all parents driven. So it's parents support, it's not therapy. Um, and we have been providing uh, that service since I think we're about 15 years in or so. And we have like a network of about 2000 parents or so. Um, and now it's across the world. We have folks in you know, far and wide other countries. There are like 14 groups a month. They're all free. And so there's groups for parents of trans kids, trans girls, trans boys, younger kids, non-binary parents with kids who have autism, um, parents who are looking to support specifically around surgical stuff, right? So it's transformingfamily.org and it's all free. And there's just a tremendous amount of resources and information. Um, it's a great place for parents to get community, which again, as I think I've said numerous times, is critical. Supported parents are just better at supporting their kids. Um, that's just how that goes. So uh, that's a resource that I wanted to share. I think I got everyone. Again, my email is open. If you ever want to send something, let's say you think of something tomorrow morning, um, I'd be happy to add that in. It's probably going to take me about uh, probably a few days to compile this information and get it onto the website. Um, thank you everyone who sent in questions. And I'd like to remind you that these questions will be uploaded as well as the video on our website. And a huge thank you to the panelists who donated their time today uh, with us and helping um, celebrate Trans Month and Trans Day of Visibility, uh, which happened on the 31st. I also want to thank um, the interns who are on the call and uh, staff members who helped support uh, this panel happening. I want to address a series of questions we received that highlighted the absence of Black trans voices from this panel, as well as the lack of highlighting the Black, Indigenous, and persons of color trans experience throughout Trans Month. As the event coordinator, I am going to take responsibility for this oversight, and on behalf of Stonewall Chico, I want to offer an apology. Thank you for allowing me and the Stonewall staff a moment to really pause and reflect on this feedback, and I do welcome it. In alignment with growth and progression forward, I want to personally invite all Black, Indigenous, and Brown voices to connect with me. I welcome your perspective, your ideas, and hopes for Stonewall in the future. I also want to invite you to join the BIPOC Pride Committee. I want to preference that, that although this group is centered around Pride Month, um, our work will not end after June. Thank you again, everyone, and I'll stay on. If there are follow-up questions, but other than that, have a beautiful rest of your afternoon, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thank you all. All set, Dr. Seely. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Okay. <laughs>